and then y'all will get a little thing as we're waiting. Um, I think maybe one more person we're waiting for and I'll give it maybe a little bit of time and then uh, that's it. Wonderful, so welcome everyone. If you haven't already filled out the Google Doc for the field trip, uh, I need some of that information for risk assessment from the university. So I put the link in the chat, make sure you fill it out before the end of the day. And you can tell me if you can come for the breakfast or the and or lunch, that would be helpful. Um, Dr. Ha, I know that you, Dr. Yi and Dr. Ha, if you haven't filled it out yet, it would be useful to have your um, risk stuff in there as well. And Ashley, I don't know if you've done that, but it would be helpful to have your information in there as well. That would be helpful. Thank you. I think we have everyone. So I'll just give you the temperature reading of, uh, of our little poll. We had 95% participation, which just means that uh, one of you, one of you didn't get to participate. I closed it too fast. Hmm, there's a lot of meh today. So I'm hoping that by the end of the, the class, we'll get to uplift a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't downlift. Downlift? You know what I mean. <laughs> so thanks everybody again for being here. Let me share my screen and we can start um, officially. <laughs> So today we're extremely lucky to be able to have uh, guests here in our uh, community health course. The rundown of today's class is gonna go like this. We'll just do a group check-in and that, that just means I'm just gonna show the groups, make sure everybody has a group, they're in a group. Um, and so for our uh, part, for our, for our visitors to know who's in what group and what the name of um, the, the lead or the communicator, uh, the lead communicator is for that specific group. Ashley, um, because I can't see, so Ashley, if Paul joins and I don't, uh, I don't have a chance to, I don't see him. Can you alert me? Thank you, thank you, dear. I appreciate you. Yes, I will do so. Thank you. So um, before I go forward, I wanted to first introduce two amazing professors who are here as mentors, advisors. Uh, resource people who are absolutely amazing. One of them is my really dear friend and colleague from USC, Dr. Jimmy Ha, who I have worked with over the years in research. She's here from the Keck School of Medicine. She's a social psychologist and uh, is amazing. And Dr. Ha, please give, your, give a little bit of introduction uh, to the students of who you are. Thank you, Dr. Sammy. Uh... Hi, all. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, as Dr. Sammy mentioned, we've been collaborating since probably 2010, right? Um, then we became good friends, and I'm very excited to be part of this course. And um, I do work on uh, uh, addiction science and uh, some uh, prevention work and uh, social determinants of health. So I'll be uh, giving you a guest lecture next week. I'm looking forward to that, um, to get a lot of good feedback from you guys and um, excited to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, as uh, Dr. Hall mentioned, she's going to be giving a guest lecture to you all next week on health disparities, especially in the Asian American community. And um, I'm really delighted. It's so fun when you get to be a professor and work with your friends, it's the best. Uh, and I have a new friend, Dr. Grace Yi, who has just joined us here at Cal State Fullerton in the Department of Social Work and uh, is a specialist in Alzheimer's, actually. And I, I really was excited for her to meet Paul. <laughs> so uh, Paul isn't here yet, but we're recording this so he could hear your introduction. Uh, but please tell the team, and Ashley's here from, uh, from our community organization. So please, Dr. Yi. Yeah, of course. All right, so everyone, do you hear me? Yes. All right, all right. So everyone, so nice to see you. My name is Grace E, and uh, I joined the Cal State Fullerton this fall. So if you are the freshman, then we are same cohort, sort of. 
I my major is social work actually, and I've been studying social work over ten years. And in my doctoral program, I studied uh, social work as a major, but also I studied economics for my minor. So this is the background of me, and I received my PhD degree from Indiana University. And before I came to the Cal State, I taught uh, the social work students at Indiana State University for two years. And as Dr. Muro uh, introduced, my main focal area of my research uh, is Alzheimer's disease and the caregivers, especially caregivers of uh, serving of the people living with dementia. And also I'm studying about the end of life care and ageism. And yeah, so because I am a gerontologist, so all health and social issues about all the dolls and the family members caring for their uh, aging uh, family member is my uh, population of study and concern. Then I really appreciate this opportunity to join this class and have a chance to collaborate with a brilliant student. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, I think that the group that will be working with Alzheimer's will be very delighted to work with uh, Dr. Yi as a resource person to reach out to her. So I'm looking forward to seeing what where this takes us. It's very organic. As I've mentioned before, this type of course isn't something that you can plan for and just run like a machine. It doesn't run like that. When we involve community, things are organic. We have resource people coming in and out, things get bumpy, but we do our best, right? Um, with a humble approach to the work that we do. So I'm very delighted that you're all here. Um, I'm gonna do a quick uh, overview for the students to understand what happens now. You did one assignment, you reflected, you watched a documentary called Power and Health, and you read a chapter on health disparities, understanding a general model of vulnerability before class today. That's kind of an organizing frame for you as you move forward in this class. But I wanted to also talk about where we fit in on the spectrum of community-based participatory research um, so that you know when you're developing your upcoming assignments, where, we're, where they're situated, how the course relate, coursework relates to the community work. But I'll do that very quickly as we wait for Paul to come to, uh, to, the, to the session as we wait for him to click in. But if he's not here, Ashley, I might have you go right after I do my little spiel. Is that okay? Let me just make sure I can, uh, yes, I've already said that you could share so we could do that. So let me just do that really quickly. So as a um, reminder, I think I have the groups correct. Can you all look, make sure that I did the groups correctly and that nobody's missing, if anybody's missing, tell me. Um, and the people who are underlined in red are the lead communicators. So the, the team leads that I'm asking uh, folks to um, communicate with me if needed for the team. Um, did I get anything wrong, right? Paul is here. Hi, Paul. Welcome. Thank you for joining us all the way from Chicago. Thank you. Sorry, the drive was longer than expected. No, I'm not at all. You, there's no uh, sorry needed. But I'm wondering, Paul, if you don't mind introducing yourself. I just we just introduced Grace and uh, Dr. Yi and Dr. Hi, Dr. Yi. Can you say hi to Paul so he sees you? Do you see each other? Uh, oh, Paul. Hello. There we go. <laughs> I know. It's been a while, a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Uh, I can introduce myself. My Paul. Yeah, please. Paul Wong. Yes. Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I've uh, been in the field for over 20 years now. And I was uh, a former missionary uh, before that. And uh, I, I was I actually came back here to Chicago and just drove back from Iowa to visit uh, my former seminary and uh, professors and they asked me to come back to teach. <laughs> don't, don't leave us, don't leave us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so it's reconnecting. Uh, my passion is in uh, mental health, of course, and especially in suicide uh, and community organizing. Uh, so that's the heart of uh, social work, uh, resource empowerment and community organizing. Uh, I'm an open book. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. 
and uh, I'll do the best I can to uh, respond. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate you. We're going to get to you in two seconds. And um, the reason why, Ashley, I didn't have you talk again, because we introduced you last week and you're going to give a talk. So I apologize. Do you want to say something? Let me open it for to you. No, no, no. It's okay. I don't want them to. I don't want to wear them out. I'm going to me, so it's okay. I know okay. we introduced last week. Thank you so right. much, Dr. Thank Sam. you so much. So um, I'm, as I mentioned, Paul, just for your sake, I'm going to go through a quick overview of where this class fits in with the spectrum of community-based research um, and how their assignments are going to connect to the community process that we're engaged in before they hear from you. So they have an idea. So all the students, all of you have an idea of where we're going with this, right? I have to like walk you through it because this class is quite organic. So here are the groups. And as I mentioned last week, we have one group that's focused on Alzheimer's. So Diana, as the lead, you may want to make sure you connect with Dr. Yi, have her email. Maybe Dr. Yi can put her email in the chat. Um, and group two is focused on addiction. I put tobacco here, but it could be substance use, marijuana or tobacco. That'll come out from the literature review and conversations and observations in the community. Um, and group three, you have addiction for gambling. But again, as I noted last week, it can be gambling or social media, depending on what comes out of your literature review and conversations in the community. And again, everybody in red are the team leads. So you just want to make sure, oh, who do I need to contact? Do we need to contact, uh, for example, Dr. Sammy, that's myself. If I have a question, I want to hear from only that lead in the group on behalf of the group, if possible. That's the, that's the plan. Yeah. So did I, everything I'm assuming, since there was no objections or comments, this is our correct. I got it correct. Okay. So I wanted to do this quick overview of traditional health research and community-based research, right? So traditional health research tends to focus on individuals, on individual uh, health outcomes and behaviors and or healthcare services, right? So this has a lot of work that's done in traditional approaches to research when we're thinking about health research in this space. So I want everyone to understand this is not what we're doing. <laughs> we're not engaged in a traditional focus on health outcomes, behaviors, and healthcare services, but that they actually integrate with the work that we do. What we're doing is really expanding our understanding out of the individual risk factors and the individual lifestyle factors. And we're thinking about the social and community spaces, the green space that's the social determinants of health. So all of the ways that the external world impacts health outcomes. We also may think about general socioeconomic culture, environmental conditions, racism could be part of that, discrimination could be part of that. So thinking about broader impacts of health and how they, they actually lead to particular health outcomes and health disparities. Um, the Power and Health documentary that you watched really highlighted this. And you all mentioned that in your reflections and you really highlighted that space of what is actually influencing our health that is outside of our control and what do we have power together to change? So as we're thinking about this concept in this class, we're thinking about the word community a lot. What does it mean? How does it connect to health? There is no unified definition in research of community. There are dimensions of community that are used in different spaces within research, right? If for the purpose of our class, we're thinking about community in a geographic locality and we're thinking about culture and social membership. So we're looking at Little Saigon as our community, but there's that's only a few of the dimensions of what would be considered community. Last week, when I asked you to tell me what communities you identified with, some of you identified it with a common institution, like I'm a researcher. I, I uh, Some of us focused on, I'm a feminist. I'm uh, so a shared action, maybe studying together at Cal State, being first generation uh, as, a, as a common kind of shared experience. So there are different elements and it doesn't mean anything is wrong or right. It's just, I'm showing you the dimensions that we're focused on 
are the dimensions of community that reside in geographic locality and culture social membership to a particular uh, group. So in this case, the Vietnamese American community in Little Saigon. So that's our focus. But where does community then fit into the research, the health research continuum? There's different, it's like a spectrum, right? So community-based health research can go from the spectrum of the community as data points. So the all of us research program, for example, is trying to diversify people in clinical trials so that it's not just cisgender white men in a clinical trial. They're trying to expand the data points. Then the other side of the spectrum is community as a partner in the research process. So, and there's a whole bunch of things in between. We're not doing the all of us research program. And we're, Paul and I and Ashley are, Dr. Ha, are getting to the community as partner, but this is kind of in between, right? So how we think of this is, okay, we have this geographic location of Little Saigon in Orange County. We're not the traditional health researchers that just want a bird's eye view of what's going on. We don't wanna just look at population statistics and say we're done. We wanna get more granular. We wanna get in the community. We wanna understand the textures, the experiences, the lived experiences in the community. So we're zooming in to a community to be able to understand how do we do this? In the journey of becoming partners with MFPI in the future, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ha and I and Ashley, and if Dr. Yi wants to join us and we'll work with Paul, to get to that space. This is kind of like the groundwork to get to that partnership. So the traditional approaches where research is owned and um, conducted by researchers and maybe just looking at community as data, that's not what we're doing. We're not completely doing the partnership of CBPR. We're doing something in between the green space, the green column, for example, research in the community, working with the community, Folks in the community will be our participants. They're, they won't be all of our collaborators yet, but I'm hoping we get there with Paul in the future. So what we're doing in community-based research is something in between the traditional and the community-based model. So something in between in the green space in our class. So when we think about the work that you are doing in this class, you're all developing for Paul, for Paul's organization, an assessment, a community health assessment proposal on the health outcomes that you have been assigned, which were uh, selected in consultation with MFPI over the course of the last few months, right? So Alzheimer's, addiction, and veterans health are considerations that we want you now to think about how do we do a community health assessment so that we can present these to Paul at the end, Paul and Ashley, uh, and the community to get their to get their feedback on are, is this feasible? Could this actually be done if we were to conduct this type of assessment? And if yes, who knows? Paul may even invite you to actually implement this next semester as part of your internship. Maybe I don't know. Could happen. So these are this is kind of how we're setting it up. Um, so the, the assignments that you will have coming up, you're going to engage in a little bit of traditional research as students. You're going to do a literature review, right? And I'll talk you through that after the presentation. So you're doing a little bit of that on social determinants of health, on the health outcome that you are doing in your group and the Vietnamese American community as the subpopulation. You're gonna be thinking about doing that in your literature reviews as individuals and as groups, right? Then you're going to conduct a windshield survey or, or actually it's an observation where you will go into the community the week after we have a field trip and you will observe the environment, the surroundings and you will document that in a specific format, you'll get training on that. You will also, as a group, develop what's called an intercept survey. A survey is something you can send out on a link and ask a bunch of questions. An intercept survey puts you in the community to ask the question so that the researcher is in the community asking people questions. You're not gonna actually conduct it, you're gonna propose it. 
here's what you're going to propose so that in the future, if you are invited, um, Paul's organization can use that survey in uh, an effort to collect data with community. So it'll be a partnership. So you're going to engage in this process throughout the semester in preparation of your health assessment proposal for Paul. And at the end of the semester, you will be presenting high level, memorized, professional presentation on your proposal to uh, MFPI, right? And I've mentioned this before, Paul, uh, I've said one of the most beautiful things about working with you is that you're very direct and no nonsense. And I love that because the students will be able to get very real feedback. And I've already told the students not to stress out about grade. The grade isn't what's important. What's the most important is the honoring of the community partners um, request for us as uh, assistants to be able to give you these proposals. That's the important part of this journey together. So um, that's my little spiel. Uh, and now I am absolutely delighted to turn it over to Paul and Ashley. Ashley, I didn't have a picture of you, so I had to put the University of California, Irvine. <laughs> <laughs> that was your picture. <laughs> you. So I'm going to hand it over to Paul and Ashley. I'll stop sharing, and I think you're uh, free to share. Thanks for listening, everyone. I hope that was a little clear on what we're doing. Yes, a little bit. And I'll give you more detail, but now, now you listen with what I mentioned in, in mind, okay? okay? Paul, Ashley, I don't know. Paul, you go first. Ashley, go oh, first. Which uh, Paul, should I go first? I believe I, you gave us a little snapshot of your um, your presentation. It was more like psychological, clinical. Or pre okay, so I'll do the historical context. Okay. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. It's so good to see your lovely faces again. I hope you don't get too tired of me popping in and out of your classes. Um, once again, I'm so excited to be your community liaison for the semester. And give me one second. I'm going to pull up my uh, presentation. All right. Um, one second. All right. Dr. Sammy. Okay. Ooh. All right. Share. And can you? Can you guys see my screen? <laughs> yes. now, now, now we can. It was taken. Yes. Now we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I will zoom out. Okay. Um, real quick, right before we dive right into it, um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of where I was going with this presentation. I wanted to present to you in an intentional way that would hopefully provide uh, historical, social, and cultural context of the Vietnamese community in Orange County, whom you will be working very intimately with. And I wanted to do so in an organic way that would allow you to contextualize and um, deeply connect with the, the people and stories that make up the data and the academic research and the methodologies. Um, because like Dr. Sammy said, the, at the heart of it all, um, your most important source, especially when you're working with the community, um, are the people. And so I thought that the most conducive approach to this would be a narrative approach. How many of you had heard of the Draw My Life? <laughs> Hands, <laughs> Draw My Life. Um, so it's a narrative approach. Um, early 2010s, uh, YouTubers would uh, illustrate and they would draw as they talked about their life story. And so I thought I'd adapt that approach um, as I walk you through my family's journey escaping from Vietnam and ultimately how they made it to Orange County. Um, and so let me get this started. You guys can see this well. Okay. And bear in mind that my family story is just one of what is at this point millions across the entire Vietnamese diaspora. So there will be inevitably variations um, that we come across. But I invite you as you know as I walk you through this, I invite you to note the common threads and the major themes, especially as they relate to the specific health, health outcomes that you and your groups are looking at. So as we get into it, uh, first, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of the small sliver of the Vietnamese diaspora that my family occupies. I come from a big family. My dad is one of 14, mom is one of eight. And um, respectively, uh, my, my, my dad immigrated in, um, it escaped in 1975, and my mother, uh, her journey was from 84 to 87. 
my paternal side uh, migrated to uh, Germany uh, due uh, as as a result of sponsorships. Um, I know earlier Dr. Sammy mentioned in her slides about religion, so that played a key role in my family's uh, journey too. It was the help of sponsors uh, such as Christian Brothers and uh, religious dioceses that allowed my family to migrate in that uh, route. And I know earlier I've dropped this word a lot, uh, diaspora, and so I just wanted to open the floor uh, to a little discussion of what is what is diaspora? What do we mean when we say diaspora? Um, if you can give me an example or how it comes about. I'm sorry, I can't see. Dr. Sammy, you can call on anyone because I, I can't see on my screen. So and and y'all can unmute too. What is diaspora? Do you all know this term? You've heard of immigrants. You've heard of refugees. You've heard yeah. minority community. But what is the diaspora? You may have heard that in relation to other communities as well. any examples or maybe how it comes about, like what drives or what causes uh, diasporas, anything at all. Um, I bring this up because I know last week we mentioned uh, in our introductions, we mentioned that so many of us are first gen and so many of us come from, you know, a family of immigrants. So, so many people in the United States do. And so I, I thought that this would be a great starting point. So if anyone wants to chime in. <laughs> Diana, please go ahead. Yes. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because my Wi-Fi is going crazy right now. Um. But I might be wrong. But I think that uh, I I when I think about a diaspora, I think about uh, downtown LA, where there is little groups of uh immigrants who can they're like like Latinos. And they come from different parts of the world, just like, and, and they congregate there and they share their cultures there. So basically they are taking a little part of their country and putting it into this country, which is basically a mixture of different cu cultures colliding together. So that's pretty much it. Thank you, Diana, for contributing to the conversation. Yes, thank you, Diana. Um, anyone else? Ashley, I, not that I don't know what it is, <laughs> but you know when you just ask it for the sake of conversation this word to me means spread out disconnected um just for the sake of consult conversation okay so um exactly thank you diana thank you dr sammy um so what i'm hearing is uh it's a large group right like diana as you said it's a large group spread out scattered who share a common cultural or um, it could be regional uh, religious origin who are living away from the traditional homeland. Um, and so diasporas come about through immigration, war, forced displacement, and essentially um, it's people who are away from their homeland. They form these diaspora communities, linking their ancestral homes with their new ones. And so I bring that up to segue into this. I know I meant I earlier I showed you a little sliver of you know, the diaspora that my family takes up, Vietnam, USA, and Germany. And I wanted to put it right up to this. This is just an imagery of the entire Vietnamese diaspora. Um, and I invite you to keep this image in mind as we slowly build the building blocks for your contextual understanding of the Vietnamese community. I, I know I'm starting fraud and I'm gonna slowly zoom in on the little Saigon community, but I invite you to uh, think of this image, especially as it relates to your own experiences um, with your own uh, communities as well. And we will segue to the next portion. All right. And I'm sorry, uh, just to make sure you, you all can see the images just fine. Okay, I know I'm taking like a different approach to the PowerPoint approach, so. I love this more, it's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we're traveling, we're, 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 we're gonna journey through this. Okay, um, so just a quick snapshot. Uh, we're zooming in a little more now, so we started a little global. Now I'm gonna zoom in onto Vietnam itself, and I'm gonna start with a little journey with just my family's own migration journey within Vietnam. So my, both my, and just to preface this, I had the lovely grace of my parents of uh, sitting down with me to talk and walk me through this journey. So it's thanks to my parents that I have this content. And so my both my 
father's and mother's side are originally from northern Vietnam. And it was after the uh, Indochina War in 1954. We'll, we'll get a little, we'll brush up on it a little more, but it was after the Indochina War of 1954, uh, the collapse of the French colony and the a subsequent takeover of the communist regime that drove my family from the northern Vietnam to southern Vietnam. And I bring this up because I've often heard iterations of this growing up. I've often been told that Vietnam, Vietnamese people are a people of tragedy. Um, Vietnam has experienced centuries of foreign uh, occupation, uh, interference, internal conflict, and civil war. And so its history is extremely complex and it's intertwined with, um, with neighboring countries like Laos and Cambodia, Mongolia, and China. And so I, I, there's no way for me to condense all of that, but I do my best. Uh, I just wanted to give you a snapshot of uh, the, the history of the country uh, in terms of the conflicts that it has um, undergone in, in, uh, in most recent years. So China occupied Vietnam for a thousand years. Uh, before it was ejected in 938 AD, and then you had the subsequent invasions by Mongol, and then, uh, as we know, the French occupation uh, for over 100 years, and this is essentially what laid the groundwork for a lot of the, the simmering resistance and, uh, you know, the intensifying the pursuit of change that, you know, ultimately set the groundwork for the Vietnam War, which um, segues into as we know, the crisis that ultimately led to the displacement of millions of Vietnamese refugees. And so with that being said, I want to walk you through my family, my parents' individual journeys. Um, I routed, I know it looks like a mess. I promise I will walk us through this. Um, I routed my parents' individual journeys. And something I'd like you to pay attention to or note is that their journeys are very different. Uh, Key dates, 1975, whereas my mother's is 1984. Um, they're very different. And I wanted to, before we get into their individual journeys, I'd like to preface it with um, just distinguishing the different waves of refugees that, um, that make up the Vietnamese community. Um, the refugees are often lumped together simply because most escaped with uh, their clothes on their backs. And so, but when, whenever we lump uh, refugees together in this way, we neglect the specific distinctive immigration processes that happened in each stage and um, along with the levels of reception that they received. And so that's something I wanted to point out was that um, when you're thinking about refugee uh, and especially communities within the Vietnamese population, we need to know how they escaped when they arrived and the variation in uh, socioeconomic status. And so real quick, the first wave uh, arrived in 1975. We had the end of the Vietnam War and the fall of Saigon, which led to the US sponsored evacuation of over 140,000 um, refugees. And these refugees are, were, most of whom were educated. They spoke some English and oftentimes they were mainly military personnel or urban educated professionals or people with association with the US military or the uh, South Vietnamese government. And so the government, um, uh, the US government essentially prioritized them uh, it, since they were targets of the communist uh, forces. And so that's that's sort of a snapshot of the first wave uh, that arrived in 1975. And then we move on to the second wave. Um, this wave is, uh, began in 1978. They are known as boat people. And later on, as we go through my mother's story, I'll, uh, it'll become clear why. Um, and this wave of refugees received colder reception from the American public. They were generally poor, um, less educated, um, less well-equipped for American life. And um, they've experienced political repression, trauma on the high seas, and harsh conditions in refugee camps. And another thing to note is that um, 
The American public support for refugees waned during this period as the economy sunk into a recession. And so they received a much colder reception from the American public at this time. Uh, there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment that arose uh, during this time that was fueled by a declining economy. And that's the second wave. And then we have a coinciding wave uh, with the second wave. And this is between the periods of 1979 to 1999. This is the U United Nations orderly departure program where they allowed migration directly from Vietnam to the US. And so unlike early arrivals, this group contained fewer ref refugees and um, more than 500,000 were um, uh, assimilated into the US and across uh, the country in the spring. And finally, we have a subsequent migration, which mainly consisted of immigrants you reunifying with relatives in the United States. So as we move forward, and as I walk you through my, my family's journey, I just want you to note like the different waves, the different key characteristics that um, make up these, uh, these refugees because they set the groundwork, especially for their trajectory for how they uh, managed to adapt and whatnot. So we'll move back. Thank you for bearing with me with this journey. Like Dr. Sammy said, this is a very organic. <laughs> All right, so we start with, um, just real quick, just for, based on what I've told you, uh, and based on what you know about the different waves of refugee, wh which wave would my dad's journey fall under? Anyway. <laughs> Y'all, one of you unmute, so Ashley knows you're listening. <laughs> what I'm sorry, what year did it say that he... Uh, can you see it on the screen? 1975. So if my dad immigrated in 1975. Uh, so then that would be the first wave. Yes. Thank you, Isabel. Yes. <laughs> so my dad would be um, the first wave and it was pure circumstance too. I know I mentioned earlier that uh, the first wave uh, tended to be better equipped. Uh, they were more educated, spoke some English. My dad just happened to be he told me he was just lucky. He happened to be in the right time, the right place at the right time. He happened to be with a bunch of Vietnamese people that work for Americans and people who had connection. And he saw them leave and just followed them with no paperwork or anything, just the clothes on his back. He left his motorbike at the embassy. Um, and, you know, it, when you deep dive on your own research, you'll see that it was very chaotic. Um, but I will zoom in on a quote directly from my father. Um, about the evacuation. How did you know that the US embassy was evacuating? And he just happened to be in the right time, right place, right time. I saw them carry luggage. I was standing there. I saw that the people getting on the bus, I knew that they were going somewhere. Um, yeah, and so essentially my dad was part of this wave of refugees. Their first stop was Guam. It's a naval base uh, where he spent two weeks. One day they told everybody, if you don't have paperwork, their stay would be uh, delayed or they might even send people back. Luckily, there was a Vietnamese family who had legal paperwork who offered to put um, him on their family list as a child. Um, and so he was a teenager at that time. He spent two weeks in Guam before uh, they flew uh, refugees out to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. So I kind of map it here, right here. He goes from, can you see my little blue indicator? <laughs> he goes from uh, he goes from Guam to Fort Chaffee. This is his first stop in the United States. And this is where he spends a month. Fort Chaffee was um, sort of an intake. This is where they uh, processed a lot of Southeast Asian refugees. And I, I believe it's like over 50,000 Vietnamese refugees who um, came to Fort Chaffee. And this is where they learned English. My dad said that they watched movies and they fed them very well. Um, so that's something to note too about the differences in the journey. Um, there's a lot of resources there. And following his stay in Fort Chaffee, this is where a lot of refugees waited for sponsors. Um, at the time, the U.S. would only allow you uh, to resettle if you had sponsors. And so that was the main route that, um, that a lot of refugees took during that time was through sponsorship. And so my dad was actually sponsored by Christian Brothers, uh, a religious organization that took in these refugees. And he went from Fort Chaffee to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he lived uh, with the Christian brothers. And there he was taught English. He attended school. 
um, under their guidance and care. And then he spent a short stint in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, again with Christian brothers. And I asked him about just, you know, his experience with uh, racism and whatnot. Um, he didn't experience it at the time. So that that could give you an indicator of this sort of sentiment uh, the, the American public had. They really welcomed, um, generally they welcomed refugees more during this time uh, since there was, you know, more of a large sense of guilt that came with the war uh, and their involvement in the war. And so my dad spent time in Tennessee before he ultimately wait, made his way to California. Um, and he attended a Catholic event in Mountain View, California, and uh, ultimately met family in El Monte. And he said, the first time I visited, I felt that Cali is the place I want to live. <laughs> All right. And that is a little bit about my dad's journey. I'm going to bounce over to my mom. So my dad's uh, journey to Saigon, this is in 1980. I want to bounce a little bit to my mother's journey now. So I'm going to bring up the question again, based on what you know about what I regurgitated earlier. Um, can anyone make guesses on like which wave of refugees my mom would be a part of? Just from this little snapshot about people. Um, Anyone? <laughs> yes, Noah. Um, I guess second. Yes, yes. So my mother was part of the second wave of refugees. If you remember the the characteristics there. Um, and real quick before I bounce into her journey, I wanted to bring up why so many, uh, in terms or for my parents, they felt they had to leave. The main reason was because both my grandparents were veterans of, uh, they were soldiers. For the South Vietnamese military, and along with they fought alongside the U.S. and so, um, essentially, re-education camps uh, were prison camps operate operated by this communist government in Vietnam, and so they were essentially it was a means to allow Vietnamese to reintegrate into society and um, through repression and indoctrination. But by both accounts, on both my mother's and father's side, they said it's touted as re-education camps, but a lot of it. Uh, was forced labor and um, they endured torture uh, in these camps. And so um, the reason why they felt they had to escape is because there was no prospect, especially if you were um, in any way affiliated with uh, the Southern side um, where they face political repression and economic um, economic uh, hardship. So they had to leave. And so that, that kind of sets the groundwork for uh, my mother's escape because following the fall of Saigon, uh, my grandparents sent, uh, spent several years in re-education camps, and as soon as they were released, they felt they had to go. Um, yeah, so I will. Ashley, did you see Noah's question in the chat? Uh, I cannot see that. Oh, yes, the chat. Yes, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Who's Jack? I thought, yes, he's cute. Oh, I will bring this up. Sorry, sorry, I should have noted this. So Jack, I thought it's not spelled correctly. Um, there's missing marks, but Jack, I thought is the Vietnamese term for re-education camps. And yes, he is very cute. That is my grandfather. <laughs> uh, yes, so Jack I thought is the term uh, we use to, uh, it's, it's re-education counts. So my grandparents had to go through that. And following their, uh, their release from prison is when they planned their escape uh, due to the lack of prospects and just the political repression and economic hardship, as I mentioned. Um, and so this is, we're gonna go into my mother's journey now. And this is my mother. This is a year before escape. It took her three attempts. I, her oldest brother, it was 12 attempts. And each attempt, uh, they would be captured and then they would have to work in fields or um, they'd have to clear jungles of uh, the kids. So my mother, uh, on her third attempt, was able to make her way out of Vietnam. And I'm going to backtrack a little bit. How they escaped was actually they had to escape in pairs. Um, they couldn't, you know, go as a big group. They had to escape in pairs. So that's essentially what set up the groundwork for sponsorship was because she had had um, relatives who had left before her and they'd make it and then slowly it would just be them one after another. And so my mother on her third escape, uh, third attempt was able to escape through the jungles, walking um, into Cambodia where she spent two months um, just waiting for the right conditions for um, her alongside with many other uh, Vietnamese refugees who were escaping and they were able to wait for the right conditions for them to leave by boat to Thailand. 
okay and I don't have pictures unfortunately of a very traumatic time but I got this from the New York Times this is essentially what these boats uh some of these boats look like just very crammed um awful conditions um but you see these refugees they didn't know if they were going to survive they didn't know where it was going to take them but it was um bad enough that they felt that they had to leave and so this is what my mother did um she made it to Thailand and we uncovered a treasure trove of pictures actually with inside these refugee camps. So this is at the Klong Yai uh, refugee camp in Thailand. And this is fall of 85 at the CQ refugee camp in Thailand. And um, I have to fact check this, but I believe that at this time around when the height of the refugee crisis was happening, uh, the UN was able to tap into some resources and um, were able to fund some of the um, provisions that they needed at these refugee camps. But for many of it, for much of it, it was very um, awful conditions. And from Thailand, she spent two years there where you essentially have to wait to be accepted um, if you're waiting to be um, accepted into the like United States. And she had sponsorship. And so uh, she was given, they escalate, I guess, the um, the priority. And so she was able to go to the Philippines at a different refugee camp. And there, during the duration while you're waiting from the Philippines to get into the United States, uh, you learn English. Uh, and so that is my mother, the refugee camp. Okay. And from the Philippines, uh, she made her way to um, California, Southern California. And Initially, it wasn't Little Saigon, it was actually Riverside, and I'm going to tell you why. It's because two of her brothers who escaped before, like I mentioned, they escaped before, two of her brothers um, had settled in Orange County, and um, they, when they heard that they had four uh, sibling, four teenagers who were coming to uh, the United States, they actually decided that they had to leave Orange County and to go to Riverside, because at that time, According to my mother, or at that time, Orange County was um, very bad. A lot of Vietnamese uh, teenagers joined gangs because their parents didn't have time to take care of them and they had to go to work. Um, and so kids that went to school got bullied. And so, you know, in, in an attempt to uh, survive, they joined gangs. And so the conditions were really bad. And so I just want to highlight that just because um, it points again to the different sentiments that were different within the different uh, refugee waves. And so my mother originally uh, went to Riverside first before a year, two years later, when her younger siblings moved to Washington, she was able to come back to Orange County with her older siblings. And they weren't concerned, too concerned about the, um, the conditions in Orange County at the time. And this is 1986, by the way. So I know there's like a little outside. So 1986, um, Orange County at the time, that was what they were facing. And... Yeah, and so that is a little walkthrough for uh, my parents' journey. And I wanna bring it back to this, just the differences in uh, the refugee waves. And move on to, all right. Ashley, this is amazing. And what an opportunity for you to connect to your yes. parents and the history of your, like the ancestry this way, I mean, we're so lucky that you're providing us the, <laughs> this context. Really, yes, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, initially refugee settlement policies dispersed Vietnamese across the country in an effort to avoid financially um, burdening local social services. However, out of survival, a lot of Vietnamese regrouped in regional areas where they could find better social services, uh, better education, better employment opportunities. And so this is essentially how large clusters uh, large clusters came about. And it's why we have these enclaves of Vietnamese in San Jose, uh, Washington, um, in different parts of the country. And none other than the biggest enclave, which is Orange County. Orange County has the biggest population of Vietnamese outside of Vietnam itself. We, I think there's a term they called it like Vietnam Vietnam, Vietnamese American capital, um, it's the capital, uh, essentially outside of Vietnam. And um, right here, I know we're 
going to look at this map a lot. Little Saigon was originally a small section of town spanning four blocks, but it's since expanded to include parts of Fountain Valley and Huntington Beach. But I know for the purposes of our, purposes of our class, we're going to focus more on uh, the core original uh, Little Saigon, which, compo which is composed of Santa Ana, Westminster, and Garden Grove. And um, right here, I'm going to go over my mother described it best. I asked her why Orange County. She said good weather, um, but it was also because the community grew as businesses opened and families set up. Vietnamese that came could work at businesses that are already set up where they could communicate in Vietnamese such as restaurants or tailor where they didn't have to speak English. And so I bring us back to these different waves of uh, refugees. They had a range of different human and social capital. Um, the first wave had like more connection, social connections, former American contacts or contacts they knew in Vietnam. And so they were able to come and establish this array of businesses beyond just the typical grocery or the typical store. And then from there, the subsequent waves, um, uh, especially those with limited job skills or English language capabilities, um, who, are, who were more dependent on the ethnic economy for employment, were able to then come in. And that's essentially how uh, the Vietnamese Little Saigon was able to be this self-sustaining uh, community, not only just being able to build it, but to continue to stimulate and sustain its growth too. And yes, and let's see. Um, I asked my parents this question. Um, how did you see Orange County evolve over the years? Orange County started to have more businesses and offices, a lot more services to help other Vietnamese. Governmental services never had any Vietnamese people, and now there are a lot. So that highlights the political clout that this community has um, um, has grown. And then for my father, he said, when I first came to Bolsa Avenue, had very little businesses now it's starting to lower K-Town. So I'm a witness to see how the Vietnamese community has grown really fast. And yes, and we will learn more about this as we do the walking tour. And finally, I just want to wrap it up with just the key takeaways. The, just want you to, I invite you to just keep in mind the historical, the socio-political and cultural context of which uh, illness might arise within this population. I, I know there was a lot of content that we dabbled in, but um, hopefully these little uh, pieces can kind of get your gears turning uh, in terms of how we think about health. And then the next point is just the characteristics of different waves of Vietnamese who came to the U.S., um, that's very important in terms of just, it lays the trajectory. I, I've experienced it myself, just, you know, I was born in the United States, but my parents' refugee experiences definitely, um, we never quite settled is the, the only way to put it. We never quite settled and um, much of it is unspoken. And so those different waves, the different characteristics and how that lays the, the groundwork and the trajectory for the rest of their lives for the past 40 years uh, really, dictates um, their relationship to services and health and whatnot. And finally, just the impacts of war and resettlement on the community. All right, any questions? Thank Ashley, you. I so appreciate it. Can we all give the <laughs> Ashley a round of applause uh, for that in-depth view? I'm wondering if, um, before I hand it over to Paul, if Dr. Ha or Dr. Yi had any reflections from your areas of expertise, why it was so important for us to understand how Ashley presented this, like the characteristics of different waves. How does that impact our work in uh, community health spaces or in social psychology or in social work? Just from uh, Dr. Ha and Dr. Yi, totally putting you on the spot. Any reflections uh, thinking about how important this was in terms of context or cultural awareness for research? Yeah, um, Ashley, this was so wonderful. I mean, it was an yeah. excellent presentation and I uh, really enjoyed the format of the presentation. I mean, not only the content and the juiciness of all the <laughs> uh, family history and all that. I mean, it really kind of contextualizes some of the disparities that we might um, observe in terms of our health outcomes. Uh, as Dr. Sammy mentioned earlier, uh, health outcomes um, should be considered in many different uh, multi-level uh, framework. Um, you know, there's like the historical 
uh, event that had taken place that affects certain groups more than others. And there's obviously this cultural trauma that um, that has affected intergenerationally and that's still lingering and that would have sustaining effect on mental health and what drives some sort of health behavior of that group. And this is just particular for Vietnamese community, but you can reflect upon what might have happened for your own community that you might identify with or um, is trying to study. So I think it really kind of puts, uh, you know, different lens, how we look at, um, how we think about public health and what that means. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you for bearing with me. I know it was like, there's it was a lot of information, but thank you so much for walking with me through that journey. It was also a journey for myself uh, too, as I was learning about um, the history of my own family. So thank Sorry, you. Sorry, just one thing to uh, highlight that I think we really need to pay attention to um, the importance of policy. Um, as Ashley just demonstrated, it really depends on how the immigrants were received and that makes a huge difference in terms of their lives and uh, moving forward and how they settle and all that stuff. So, excellent. Good point, Dr. Ha. Um, it's been about an hour and I know that Paul is in Chicago. It's later for him and I would love to give him the floor. Is it okay, class, yes. everyone, if we keep going? Do you have stamina? We can honor our guests. Thank you so much. And we might come back to you, Ashley, for questions at, after yes. Paul, if that's okay. Right. Um, so if you don't mind, if you stop sharing so that Paul uh, yes. can share. Let me... And uh, Paul, after Ashley stops sharing, you have the floor. Thank you again. Sorry. Um... Well, what Ashley uh, prepping that, thank you very much. It is, as uh, Dr. Ho sh share. Uh, it is a very meaningful presentation, and I happen to be fall among the second class of uh, the second wave of uh, refugee. Uh, so I am one of the refugee boat person that escaped uh, in the 80s, uh, late 80s. And the other side of the story that uh, was not shared, uh, not many people were aware of it until, unless they're in it, is that during the late 80s, that's when the UN and the US has stopped the policy of accepting refugees. So during those period, any boat person that's uh, found or discovered on the ocean, they were left alone. They are not rescued. Some were uh, killed uh, as well. So there's another research uh, that that, uh, that have uh, been made known to our community years ago is that after the war, there are about almost close to 2 million Vietnamese uh, refugees escaped Vietnam after the war. Uh, about 80% of those who escaped by boat die on the ocean. Uh, so I have a, a lot of family members who die uh, on the ocean. Uh, my boat, we were on the ocean for about 30 days uh, without food, uh, water, uh, and we were attacked by Thai pirates three times. Uh, we were uh, uh, thrown into the movie, The Hurricane, The Perfect Storm. We, we experienced several of those as well. Uh, but before I go into my presentation, I'd like to bring it back to what Dr. Sami shared earlier about what you have experienced and how you have the... Uh, uh, associate yourself or connect yourself with the term community. And so I ask if you're ready, either put your finger on your video button uh, or your mouse on your video, video button and the instruction is if you agree, then you turn off your video, right? If you don't, then you just leave it on. So if I may ask if any one of us here at any point in your life where you feel you are invisible, not included, if you say yes, then turn off your video Okay, so you see it as so much as uh, how many in our community or in this class here at one point in our time, right, have, have experienced the sense of not being included, the sense of being invisible to the either the community, the family, the school, the system, whatever that may be. Okay, uh, I invite you to turn your camera back on again. The next question is if at any point in your life where you felt the services that was provided to you was not culturally appropriate or you feel understood either for by you or your family or your grandparents that experienced that suffer that service. Okay. 
Oh, thank you. You have to oh, come back again. All right. If this class was in person, we'd do something different, but at least with this, I show some active interaction. Uh, but what this I've just shown, as you indicate here, even though you're working and focusing on the Vietnamese community, we have a shared human experience. We know and we can relate to, uh, to the situation of what it meant or how it feels to not be included, not be included in the research, not be included in a clinical trial study. And what happened when those research and clinical trial studies take place and you're not included or that your population, your communities are not included, then the drugs that are developed are not for your physical makeup. The policies that are driven, right, are that are established is not for the, it's not including your community's needs or the voices or the dynamics. And so that's why public health is so important. What you do right now, even though it's a class, I invite you to be as present as possible. What you give in is what you take out. And the work that you do right now, this material that you're learning right now, will not only help you pass the class, I don't care about passing the class or not, to be honest, right? What you do here will impact your life for the rest of your life. What you do now will impact the people that you encounter every day. You will start seeing situations around you differently with a different lens, right? You will see and you will be able to identify when the policy is established by the city council or by up by federal, state, county, right? Or even within an agency, even within a, your own institution as a university, right? When you, you would notice, hey, well, hey, this is not right. If it's not right, what can you do about it, right? So in a system where minorities get oppressed, right? But people who has power wants to maintain that power or even want to gain more, then what that means is that it's, it's a system of health. Those who are voiceless, those are ostracized, those who are considered second class citizens, right? Get punished, get deprived of their resources. And so on behalf of my community, even though Dr. Sam keeps saying, you're doing this for Paul, it's not for me, right? And it's not just for my community. It's for you as well, and it's for your community as well, because what you will present later on, my goal is to also be able to present in front of city council member, present in front of a state deputy department director for public health, right? The work that you do, this is gonna be one of the first time that our community is being researched. Because when, when the topics I brought up for Dr. Sami to share with you to focus on, there are no data for this in a community. When I approached the state uh, years ago and talked about how our community, the Vietnamese community, needed resources to deal with gambling addiction, their responses to me was, oh, the Vietnamese community have no gambling problem. And so those who live in the communities are like, what the hell are you talking about? You definitely don't know our community. Because if you ask any Vietnamese community members, eight out of 10 will identify either they know someone who has an addiction or they themselves going through that uh, addiction. So gambling addiction is very tied to a community and it has a cultural aspect of it as well, especially those who grow up in a poor environment. Because in our community, it would focus on luck. Gambling and luck goes hand in hand. Right? And luck is a one way to be able to get out of poverty uh, and also give them option. And so those are things I like to invite you to keep in mind. My apologies to Dr. Sami and Ashley. And uh, I switched the presentation yes last night. Uh, I, I surprise you guys, and some of the slides gonna uh, overlap with what Ashley have shared. Uh, but I wanted to bring the context again, the psychology part of it, but also the social context, the historical context, but also looking through the sociology lens, through the psychology lens, and then hopefully that will help inform you to develop what type of questionnaires, how do you frame your questions, depending on what immigration wave the individual you encounter. Because if you ask a certain question, a certain way with a different wave, you will get a completely different response or you will, will get rejected right away, right? And so with that, I'm gonna share with you my screen. Okay. Let me move this out of the way. Okay. So this is uh, one of the PowerPoint I've used to do training uh, for clinicians a couple of years ago, but I kind of modify a little bit for this class. So here is it's a sort of snapshot, right, of what Ashley just shared earlier in regard to the different immigration waves, right? 
the boat person, right? And before that, we the the like as rescue, right? The ODP area era where they come and they reunify, and then those who come later on where it's by airplane. There is another wave of uh, migration to the U.S. but from the Vietnamese that not many people are aware of. Uh, there are Vietnamese documented Vietnamese who live in the U.S. in the 1960s. Uh, one of my clients and, and the people I work with in the past, she was one of the first Vietnamese psychiatrists in the U.S. And she uh, came here. Uh, and those those who come here before 1975, those are the ones who are very highly influential in Vietnam, highly educated in their class and they're well, well influenced. And so because of that, they get a chance to go to different countries to study and work and live. Um, here is my short story of my uh, of my history and where I am today. This is the house, right? It's, it's not the exact house, but it's similar. It's the same one I grew up in in Vietnam. And uh, I still remember helping my dad made it out of mud, where I was stomping the mud and the straw together to form the material, the clay here, to put along the wall to form our house. So I still remember that pretty clearly. I also remember our escape from Vietnam by boat. This is very much the same exact boat that my family, 27 other men, women, and children escaped in Vietnam in 1987. Uh, and so we came out. Uh, I put this picture here to honor my dad, my grandparents, all of those who fought for the war, but also the American uh, soldiers as well. And because of all the sacrifices, freedom doesn't come right for free. Right? It comes at a great cost. And so this picture here has always ingrained in me of how valuable freedom is. And the statement I've always believed and practiced is with freedom comes accountability. Because without accountability, freedom is anarchy. And so we have to be accountable for our freedom and what we do and the consequences of, that, of our choices. And because of the sacrifices upon which I've grown, upon which I've developed, I'm able to be where I am today, where I'm able to uh, in a one sense, they become successful to be able to train, teach, and do clinical work in the community and, and statewide. In my course of training uh, and developing my own agency, I've come up with this statement here that kind of summarizes uh, my mentality in working in crisis mode. And so there are opportunities in every moment, whether we use the moment as an opportunity to stay in the same place or move forward depends on our decision at this very moment. And so what that means is that from a CBT uh, approach, right? Our minds has much power. For us to continue and uh, to bring this back to you and what you do or will do either in this class and in the future as in the public health sector is that to work with any community or to work with any populations or individual, right? The micro, meso, macro level, even in your writing of research or policies later on, awareness is key. Awareness of yourself, awareness of others, awareness of your environment is important. And we talk about, and your class has talked about last week about community, uh, actually talk about culture. We know that there are cultures and there's a subculture Right? And that's even more detail depending on what we associate with. And so and culture is organic. And so our approach, if it's not organic, then we're not catching up or we are not adjusting to the culture that we currently work with. In social work, there is a statement, uh, there's a saying that, that is very true. We always try our best to meet our clients where they are at. Physically, emotionally, psychologically, wherever they are at, we try to meet them and not impose our agenda or our motives onto them when we work with, with our clients. And so that awareness part is important, right? So in Vietnamese here, awareness is mean eater. So that's when you guys be familiar with this terminology later on when you work with uh, the Vietnamese community. Uh, so that awareness of self, right? if you were to, if, if this train was in person, I, I'm able to see you, but since I can't see you, I'm visualizing, right? If this is you, being reflecting upon yourself, right? Without a mirror, none of us can see ourselves. Without a reflection, none of us can see what we look like, right? But so, but through psychologies and through our mutual affirmations and, and uh, confirmation from other sources of information, right? By others, by our environments, then we can get a little bit more awareness 
of who we are and what we do. So if you, I invite you to learn this course, learn this time, not just today, but during this journey of yours through this public health field. As Ashley, I've gone through her exercise of my, tell my story, right? Go through your own story. Go through your own story, understand your history, understand your roots, uh, understand what are some factors in your history that has influenced and contributed to where you are today and who you are today. Because if we are not aware of what triggers our automatic responses, then we cannot control it, we cannot modify it, we cannot replace it. So the best way for us to, to do any of that is to be able to raise and become more aware, self-aware of our automatic responses and our trauma informed, right? In, the, in that term uh, of how our histories have uh, informed and influenced us. And then when you interact with other people, how are you aware? Right. In the Vietnamese, Vietnamese communities, how they interact Oh, Paul, oh, oh, your, your sound cut out a bit. Yeah, give me one second. I'm sorry, someone, my headset is also connected to my phone, so I just got to cut me off. Uh, okay. Uh, so as I was saying, when you work in the community and develop your questions and go and ask uh, ask the community members questions in, in focus group or just questionnaires, they will respond to you differently as when they see you as an outsider. When a Vietnamese go in and ask them questions, they will also respond to them differently because they will look at as a Vietnamese, are you a new immigrant? Are you, were you born here like Ashley? They will call her like a Mekong, right? American daughter or American child. Uh, so depending on what age and what group you they, they are you are interacting with, you'll be different responses. So being aware, as Ashley share, what time period did they immigrate or came to the U.S. in what context, that will help inform you of the education, the ability to inter interact, and their different, their different understanding of the different topics. And then the other part is that depending on the waves, those who are poor and come here for a better lifestyle, they are so focused on working. They don't learn the language they don't, because they don't learn English. Then they can't. They don't, they won't know their rights. They get taken advantage of by labor law, for example, by uh, other people that's oftentimes within their own community who take advantage of their own uh, Ill illiteracy of the law and their rights and benefits. And so, being aware of that will be very important uh, when you develop your questionnaires and your in interaction with them. And then this is something that I share a lot with my clients when I work with clients in sessions. And I do this in my own personal social life as well. At this moment when we're interacting, you're, focus, you're focusing on me, on my face. I'm focusing on you, on your face when we interact with each other. Rarely do we focus on the spaces in between. How far do we sit apart? How far do we stand apart? Right? How's our tone when we talk to each other? How comfortable are we going with, with, with each other? So the spaces in between represents and symbolizes the process. It's our process that we have established is it solid, is it strong? If it's not, what can we do to be able to enhance our relationship with each other? So that, that in-between space is not just emptiness, but it's filled with meaningful bridging connection, right? <clears throat> and then at the other part, we talk about cultures already. And the culture here doesn't matter where you're from. <clears throat> I, I love this image because for me, this is art. And culture, when we look, or when we are able to step back, we, even with all of our trauma, right? Even with all our histories of everything that's bad or worse, when we put it together as an art picture, we are so colorful. And that diversity of experiences, that diversity of histories, and that diversity of abilities, right? It, it helps enrich us and be, build a better community. Yeah. This is an image that Ashley has already shared with you already. But I want us to be able to look at this and see how this will help inform you of how to formulate, formulate your questions. When we talk about the Vietnamese people in general as a people of war of, or people of trauma, because of our genetically, we, we are codified, right? When we experience any trauma over a period of time, as part of evolution, that part of our experiences is, in, is encoded into our gene. And that's passed on down to the next generation. So those characteristic traits, right? There are actually research that's already been shown 
how trauma experiences, intergenerational trauma, everything else get passed on down to from generation to generations. And that will help us inform of when we approach people and talk to people. The climate also, right? The climate will also impact the, the different cultural dynamics. In the Northern regions where it's dry uh, and the food is very scarce because it's dry, whereas in the South, it's more closer to the equator, it rains a lot more and the, uh, the, there's more resources and richness of it. So the personality of the people like the island is very laid back. They are very carefree and they're very willing to give generously. Whereas the people in the Northern part, the cultural part, because their, their resources are so scarce, they tend to hold on to the, uh, and, and, and hoard their resources and they're not as willing to share as much. So historically, that, those are some dynamics that has impact and then causes a lot of influences and, and conflict within. And, and then the weather as well, the weather will impact how people respond uh, <clears throat> and their personality as well. One second. So what are all of these uh, uh, factors? How are they relevant to you and to what you do? I'm gonna share with you next a few stats that's maybe very shocking, but I want you to be able to see and to see how the history of trauma, the history of different cultural dynamics, how would that impact you and inform your uh, development of your questionnaires, of your approaches, of your methodologies when you go and research and interact with our community, right? So this is a timeline. We're skipping out this, the pre-25 because those are the ones that are very well off already. Uh, those who experience traumas in different conditions comes right after 1975. Right. So here's one fact that, we, that was recently published. Right. So in the US, according to the VA's uh, database or data of 2020, six out of 100 people in the US is diagnosed or has a develop uh, has the PTSD, right? Whereas in contrast for the Vietnamese community, this research was done by uh, Norway and Australia, uh, both countries in 2021. In the Vietnamese community, in the, among the Vietnamese refugee, 50 out of 100 people has a diagnosis of PTSD. So you see the contrast here when you deal with trauma in a community. The other fact here for depression in the US in the general populations, eight out of 100, right? According to the National Institute of Mental Health in 2020, eight out of 100 has a diagnosis of depressions. Whereas in the Vietnamese community uh, of the Vietnamese refugee, 75 out of 100 has depression. So how does this impact their physical health, their social health, their economics, right? Everything else, how does that impact family dynamics, right? So here, this is uh, an old uh, stats, but this shows the populations in the US of Vietnamese uh, growing from 1980 to from 231,000 to 2012. For according to our latest data from 2020 census, we are over 2 million Vietnamese in the US. Uh, this is, uh, we can skip this because uh, from this training, I also involve more hands on. Uh, yeah, so the training we can skip here, but I can share some of this. So when you do your or develop your questions, right, consider the place of origin, right? Not just Vietnam, but where in Vietnam, the language capability, because depending on what age or where they are in Vietnam, they may be illiterate, both in Vietnamese and in English. The majority of those in Vietnam who are poor, they don't have an education more than second grade or third grade. Uh, and so uh, so that will be a challenge for them when, when you ask them a question and they can't respond, they will either say yes and uh, uh, shake their head, but they won't let you know that they don't understand. So how do we get information that's accurate from them? And the immigration period will help you be, to be able to understand what dynamics, what cultural and psychological dynamics will impact their schedule or their health as well as their responses to your questions. Right. So this is more for clinicians uh, when I train them, but the, this would be very applicable as well for you when you interact with a victim's community. Right. In the community, as you go and interact, safety should always be number one. Right. Physical safety, emotional safety, psychological safety. It's important to be able to know because if you don't feel safe, it's, 
what you do will be very uh, much influenced because for any person, when we are in a state of fr uh, fright or distress, we go into the fight and flight mode, which can inhibit us to be able to process the thing rationally. So it's important for us to at least mentally help be in a safe place so that we can interact with people without feeling scared or anxious um, because that will put off a different kind of energy. Establish rapport and connection will be important. Before we ask anything of the people, make sure that you have established rapport first. Also be able to uh, establish understanding and awareness. You have to be able to demonstrate that, not just say it, but demonstrate by either confirmation, uh, affirmation words, uh, or uh, so there'll be more practice later on when you do the training, the field, we'll do some more training on that. And then motivation. How do you motivate someone to answer your question? For the Vietnamese community, not many people participate in research study. Uh, one, because uh, there's a lack of understanding of how to approach the community. In all cultures, in all community, I sincerely believe we all want to be healthy. We all want to be happy. We all want to be successful. We all want our kids to be successful and safe. And so if our research can tie into those core values, we can easily increase people's motivation to participate. And then that therapy alliance, not only for clinicians, but also for you when you interact with people. And lastly, as I shared with you earlier, when I started out with my uh, uh, brief exercise, when we talk about health, if there is no hope, people will feel depressed. And if there's no hope and when people are depressed, they tend to give up and they won't participate. So it's important to help people to understand what's the benefit of what you're doing with them? What's the benefit of your research? What's, how does this help improve their life personally? Not just theoretically, right? And then here are some of the essential clinical skills. Uh, I, I have more training in my uh, agency. So if you're interested, we can focus more on those training skills. Or you can take a few classes at the social work department there at uh, Fullerton. <laughs> Talk to Dr. Yi. Uh, but these are a few uh, essential clinical skills that's important to be able to establish and understand when it's appropriate to ask closed-ended question versus when to ask open-ended question. When do you reframe? When do you show emotional reflection, emotional regulations? When do you share your intention, right? As Ashley started out, right, she shared her intention verbally and explicitly. That way it takes away the assumption of part of it. How do we show mindfulness? How do we show empathy and awareness? And the lastly, this one is a lot of people struggle with this. It's how do you sit with silence? Right? When you work with people who are not comfortable talking and do you keep pressuring them and then they get this feeling they don't get interrogated? The moment when they feel they are being interrogated, that's going to trigger the trauma, especially the older generation, the first generation who have gone through the uh, education camp. These are just some uh, terminologies if you are interested in learning, right? But this, because this training was uh, developed for clinicians uh, to learn how to work with the Vietnamese community, I kind of translated for them the different terminologies and how to use it in the different contexts, right? So if this was a training in person, you would have to go through this assimilation training and to uh, the respond to this real scenario. This is a scenario of one of my former clients. But if you read this right here, I'll let you read it by yourself. But look, at this could be a very real case that you will be responding to to ask question. So how would you engage with this mother or this family dynamic? So just so that the class understands, um, because Paul is a clinician, he's a licensed clinic, a social worker, this is a training that he provides to people that have that training. The class will not be engaging in any kind of therapy or clinical work. Um, and so that's really important for everyone to understand. Now, don't run away and go all become social workers. You're in public health. But what I think is so critical is the recognition of the work in the community requires some of those skills from a clinician side that Paul was uh, expressing, like the awareness, the understanding of the cultural humility that's needed to approach the different waves of immigrants. Like the more we know about populations that we work within, the better our survey questions will be in public health, right? 
Um, and those of you who now are so excited to go and follow Paul and become a social worker instead, uh, or Dr. Yi, uh, can also understand some of the things that it would take for us to get to that level. Um, Paul, I appreciate you so much. Is that it? I didn't mean for you to stop talking. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew they didn't have to do any clinical work in the community. <laughs> That's right. No, no, that, that was the end. That was the, the simulation part was the end for people to go through to experience what it's like. Uh, to And in the real training, I actually have the mother there. Uh, so you see, in, in all my training, I would have the client to actually pre, be, take on that training. And then they get the feedback directly with the client uh, to see if uh, what was their approach effective or not. Yeah. Paul, I appreciate you so much. You um, There was a slide you showed about religion. Mm -hmm. um but we we didn't really talk about that and i'm wondering if you could give the class a little bit of context of religious dynamics or whether they're important to consider um or whether you know how how does little saigon kind of fit into that space or how does it reflect on religion and culture and when we go into the community for example um what are some things that you would recommend the students and i look for Sure. So the, for the Vietnamese community, the majority, I don't have the specific stats, but the majority of uh, the faith is uh, Buddhism uh, and then followed by Christianity and then the different sector of it. Even before that, the, the religion uh, was established within the Vietnamese culture, we have a natural animistic uh, culture of uh, believing in, very similar to the Native American, believing in our, in our environment, our spirit, right? And then uh, be able to connect to our ancestors who have passed away and honoring them by having their pictures in on uh, creating an altar for them. Our cultures have a very strong respect for our elders, of our ancestors, because we believe in, because of what they have done before us, that's why we're able to get to where we are. Uh, and so when we when you come and interact with the, our community members, show that honorific form of respect to the elders, that will gain you so much prop and credibility they will be more likely for them to participate. And if you go to a house, for example, and you see a, an elder there, go to the elder first, talk to the elder first, right? Once the elder, you establish a relationship with the elders, the elder will command the others will follow you, right? You guys do what she said or he said, right? So that 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 credibility is established with the elders will, will help you gain more uh, access into the community. Uh, in terms of religion, Unfortunately, uh, I've just learned uh, yesterday uh, visiting my uh, uh, alma mater at the seminary of uh, someone I, I know who was a, pr a priest, a Catholic priest for a long time. Somehow, a couple of years ago, he got caught up in falling into this cult uh, from Vietnam. Uh, and, and he became one of the minister uh, for the cult. And this cult or this they call them so really, uh, a religious Vietnamese Pentecostal church. Uh, they believe that any, every illness is uh, uh, people being possessed by demons. And so this particular priest, his own brother, has, uh, has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so the family was trying to help get him help. And so this priest encouraged the parents to let the, to take their brother back to Vietnam to be treated by the club, by the, his group to pray and, and exercise the demon from him. And so the way they exercise the demon, the, the illness from him or the demon is they beat him until he died. So he actually died. Uh, and then the same was for his dad and his other sister who has an illness. And, and instead of getting medical treatment, they, they they pray. They pray and then they beat him until the, until the, the supposed to the believers that the devil, the demon will, will leave the, the individual. Uh, so there is a strong tie of spirituality and connections and those who are tied to believe in talking to demons. So that dynamics kind of get blurry when we interact with people who have experienced psychosis. Is it a spiritual experience or is it a mental illness? Right. And so those are the factors when you ask question about is how you frame it. Their responses may be as a spiritual experience or maybe a mental illness experience. And because of the stigma, they're more likely going to turn towards a spiritual experience. Yeah. And I can imagine that the worldviews around health, um, when it's tied to that uh, animism or spirituality, then sometimes it's hard to portray uh, scientific information in the community in ways that are 
understood and how how like we talked about health literacy earlier with Paul that um, there is a need for uh, education around health literacy to be able to understand the resources in the community to trust scientists. These are all questions that we will talk about throughout this semester. I forgot to give Paul a round of applause. Please help me. Thank Paul. I appreciate you. Um, does anyone have a question before I uh, ask us to take a little break and then we'll come back and go into our groups. Does anybody have any questions for Paul or Ashley? Um, Dr. Yi, are, are you okay? Do you have any thoughts that you wanna reflect or Dr. Ha? Any of uh, anybody in the class, please, anyone. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So I feel like I am I am sitting in a social work class <laughs> because all the topics are familiar to me. But I'm also recognized that it is really important to the public health section as well because we have we share the same framework to understand the world so from the micro to macro perspective and everything is related to each other and also from a gentology gerontologist perspective it is really important and it is very impressive for me I mean, and important in learning um basically is when uh, we when we understand the dynamics of the community, then we have to understand the individuals and their life, um, their life. And with a life course perspective, um, we can have more clear understanding and we can, we can create more, uh, well, we can create better or best policy proposal to address the exact needs of the people. So the first thing is a comprehensive understanding about people. And I think it is a really great opportunity for uh, all in this class that we can practice that from the very beginning. And I think, yeah, I think it is a really awesome opportunity for students, but also for me. So yeah, really, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Yi. Thank you for your uh, for your contribution. Uh, appreciate everybody here. Is, does anybody have a question? Anybody want to say thank you? Unmute yourself so Paul and Ashley know that there are people behind these wonderful faces. Y'all, in a community health class, y'all got to talk. I'm telling you, this is not going to work out if it's going to be like this the whole semester. Um, okay, so the, to give our our, our wonderful participants, I mean our wonderful guests, a little break, uh, a round of applause. What does one of the students? Why don't you come back at five forty, uh, and you can go off camera if you want. Take a little break. Come back at five forty. Thank you again to my guests. I'll I'll hang out with my guests for a bit. It was wonderful, Paul. Thank you for the uh, Thank you so much, Paul thank and Ashley. Paul and Ashley. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me stop recording.